what we're going to do now is just kind of go through briefly um, the ultimate bodhicitta section and do another meditation. All right. So, so if I was to say to you, um, what is the difference between conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta, what would you say? Is it, it the, the wish to be enlightened and then the to be of benefit for all sentient beings? Yep, that's the conventional one. Yeah. Then what's the ultimate one? Okay, so I thought that was both. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you got all the pieces of the conventional one, which is very key. It's the mind with two aspirations to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. That's re relative or conventional bodhicitta. So then ultimate bodhicitta is what? Uh, the realization of emptiness with the mind of the bodhicitta. Nice. Yes, exactly. Very good. This is great. Um, and it's okay if you don't remember precisely these things. It's just to kind of keep it tidy in your mind. So ultimate bodhicitta is um, bodhicitta in the mind of someone who's realized emptiness perceptually. So an Arya Bodhisattva. So here's, here's really the confronting thing because it's about self and reality. So there's the meditation practice of remaining in a state free of conceptual elaborations without any clinging. And so the verse is, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is never to entertain concepts which revolve around dualistic notions of perceiver and perceived. In the knowledge that all these appearances are but the mind itself, whilst mind's own nature is forever beyond the limitations of ideas. And then post-meditation, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to let go of grasping when encountering things one finds pleasant or attractive, considering them to be like rainbows in the summer skies, beautiful in appearance, yet in truth devoid of any substance. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to recognize delusion whenever one is confronted by adversity or misfortune, for these sufferings are just like the death of a child in a dream. And it's so exhausting to cling to delusory appearance perceptions as real. So sitting with that, so exhausting to cling to delusory perceptions as real. So we'll go ahead and do a meditation on those. Um, so if you wanna get yourself a good posture. And come back to your bodhicitta motivation the purpose of my life is to free all sentient beings from suffering, bring them complete happiness. In order to do that, I must practice the path. I must understand cause and effect within myself. I must overcome self-cherishing and develop cherishing others into perfect bodhicitta. And from there, I'll gather so much momentum to achieve complete Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings.
And adding to your regular bodhicitta motivation, bringing in an awareness of emptiness as well, that the agent, myself, the action, meditating, and the result, the karma created, are all empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. And I need to realize this emptiness experientially in order to cut the root of samsara. So just see if you can weave in your understanding of emptiness to your connection with bodhicitta. And then with that motivation, two minutes with awareness of the breath, allowing surface distractions to settle and your background understandings to digest and integrate, creating space for the new information to come. Just the breath. And just stay with the breath and come back to the breath when you've lost it. Just very gently tether your awareness to it.
And now shift to analysis and just consider everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. And so in order to understand emptiness, we access it through the reasoning of dependent arising. So first just think all impermanent phenomena depend upon causes and conditions. A flower depends on a seed as its substantial cause, depends on sunlight, earth, water as conditions. The same is true of my own experience. The substantial cause of my experience is in my own mind. But many external conditions are what nourish and water those seeds, positive or negative, sprouting into the experience of feeling, happiness, suffering. As in the natural world, so too in my mental experience and my physical experience. And just sit with, how does that settle? Does that ring true? What's the impact of that idea on your mind? who I am, what I experience, what this world is, and what happens within it. All of it is arising from causes and conditions. Nothing is out of nowhere, spontaneous or causeless. And that might make sense to us and be something we already know. And we ask ourselves, so what? Things depend on causes and conditions. What's the point of looking at that? And so then ask yourself, when we are upset, when we're angry, when we're sad, does it feel like something has happened to us out of nowhere? That we're somehow a victim of circumstance? Or the opposite, that everything is all our fault, 100%, no other influences? Just notice the tendency of the mind to exaggerate and forget about infinite causation when we're upset how we believe the opposite is true. We think that things independently exist, even though that's not the case. So just examine what you think to yourself when you're particularly upset, the way it goes against the logic of dependent arising.
And then go more subtle and look at the fact that all phenomena, both impermanent and permanent, everything depends upon parts and context. So this is your body sitting here meditating. One thing, one body. But if you were to point to the body, you would pointing to a part which has parts, which has parts. You point, this is my body, but it's actually your shoulder. And then you say, where is your shoulder? Is it this bone or that bone? This joint, this ligament? And anything you point to is composed of more parts and more parts. And yet, before we examine, things seem to be one and obvious, self-evident. Everything depends upon context. You might be sitting in the small room in your house, but it's only small in comparison to a larger room. Maybe the living room or the dining room is bigger. It's a big room compared to your bathroom, which is smaller. So something can have a label, but the label only exists within a context. The same is true of beautiful and ugly, mine and yours, good and bad. One is true only because there's a concept of the other. And how true or how important or how solid is also contextual. So start with the obviousness of this, the truth of that, the science of it, the way part of you already knew that and compare it to what your upset mind says. Your upset mind forgets about context and parts completely and thinks if I'm mad or sad, it's because of this one thing which is bad in and of itself. And all of the other parts and conditions around it have nothing to do with how I feel. And anyone experiencing this would feel exactly as I do, even if their context and history were different. So just notice the logic of dependent arising and contrast that to what you actually say to yourself when you're upset or when you're lost in self-cherishing. And then the most subtle, all phenomena, both impermanent and permanent, both myself and others, external objects, everything 
depends upon mind's imputation on a valid basis. Everything is merely labeled by the mind. And so you can think of your memory of learning something very simple, like the letter A. When you were a very small child, you saw three lines, and then someone introduced you and said, when we see these lines, we call them A. And at first you didn't understand. You just saw lines. It was not A for you. And then this was repeated and you caught on and repeated and you believed and repeated and you began using A's. And now when you look at a piece of paper with an A on it, it seems to jump off the page at you as if those lines were telling you what they are, as if it was A from the side of the lines, rather than A from the side of your mind, labeling it on those lines. The same is true of our everyday experience. At one point, we gathered opinions about what is a good person who we want around us. We reinforce that. And then when we see someone who apparently has those characteristics, we're pleased to see them. And we think they're giving me so much joy by being here as if they injected us with the joy rather than them being a condition because we made them a condition through our conditioning, deciding this is good. On the basis of our labels comes all sorts of emotions, but we think because the emotion is there, the label is true. Vividness is not a criteria for truth. We could walk down the street and there could be a coiled hose from someone's yard. And maybe it's twilight. And when we see the hose, we think it's a snake. We can be as afraid of that hose with the same vividness and fear as we would have if it were actually a snake. If it were a snake, we'd say the snake made me afraid. But it was your mind's projection there. And so, of course, there's a practical, common sense, everyday application of labels. When we see a stop sign, we stop. But go more deeply into how believing that these labels exist from their own side, inherently, separate from the mind out there, how that can become problematic and the source of so much trouble in our lives.
And so circle back to the original premise that everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. Because we don't understand this, because we forget that we have the illusion of separateness, a belief in duality. And from that place, self-cherishing makes perfect sense and causes so much trouble. And so think the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to recognize delusion whenever one is confronted by adversity or misfortune. For these sufferings are just like the death of a child in a dream. And it's so exhausting to cling to delusory perceptions as real. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to let go of grasping when encountering things one finds pleasant or attractive, considering them to be like rainbows in the summer skies, beautiful in appearance, yet in truth devoid of any substance. and dedicate the energy of these thoughts to understanding emptiness directly in order to cut the root of samsara and enabling the mind to achieve full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. Okay, how's ultimate bodhicitta going? <laughs> I found it really um Mar saying, holy cow, it's a lot to digest. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Heather. Well, I, I don't um I don't know that I've ever been led through it exactly that way um, through dependent arising before like something's merely labeled. And I found it just incredibly helpful um, when I think about things as being just merely imputed and, and I kind of go through that exercise, I get really freaked out. If I start yeah. to, I just start to like my, my mom's, you know, the, just the whole nine and, and this was sort of like, like you made me, it was really beautiful. It just is like sort of being like infinitely held in a way, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, and the, and the investigation sometimes, I guess, because I am self-righteous and I'm working on it, I get, I get sort of put off when it feels like people, when it, when I perceive someone to be jumping to emptiness, you yeah, know, yeah. lazy, and it feels like this is just actually like, just can take just a tremendous amount of presence and investigation and, you know, staying with it. And, um, you know, I've, ha I've, I've been led on dependent arising meditations and, but, but just never like this. So it's just super, super helpful and, and lovely. 
thing. Oh, good. Yeah, good, good. I, I, uh, it's the style I find useful, hence why I do it. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Look, some of you have studied more than others. So I'm guessing some of you are like, yeah, solid. And some of you are like, what? <laughs> so, and everywhere in between. So if, if you want to unpack some more about that, um, we can do that for a little bit before we move on to the six perfections. Um, but while we're there, um, let's see. I have it here. Yeah, the um, I think the best both introductory but advanced combo book on this subject is called um, Emptiness from the Foundation of Buddhist Thought series by Geshe Teshi Sering. Oh, is it backwards because it's flipped? Anyway, it's just called Emptiness and it's purple and it's got Bodhi leaves on it. And it's that Foundation of Buddhist Thought series. Um, and everything in that series is really clear and comprehensive and they're usually available on um, ebook versions as well. But Geshe Teshi Sering, um, who is the Geshe in London, um, or was the Geshe in London before he was promoted, um, he's fantastic and clear. So I really recommend that book. And it talks about the three levels of dependent arising really clearly. Um, but yeah, was there anything that came up immediately, though, that you wanted to make sure you asked before we moved on? It's, it's a big, <laughs> it's, it's a big topic, I realize. But in terms of just kind of using it to dispel the illusion of separateness or using it to break the idea that things are as dualistic as they seem. And then from that place, your negative states of mind are less frequent or intense. Yeah, Mar, Mar did you have something? Yeah, I was thinking, is this, um, does it come from you? That dependent arising, is, is that from you? Are you the one that is the cause, so to speak, of what will happen at, within a, a certain context of condition? Uh, I, yeah, yeah. No, it's an interest. I'm just trying to unpack the um, the way you're framing it. Yeah. Uh, um, your mind is the cause of your experience. Okay. However, there are other things that influence it. Um, so it's, it's kind of, a, it becomes a tenant school conversation. So in Buddhism, we have like four different tenant schools, um, which discuss how much, quote, external reality is there. And how much are you just yelling in an echo chamber talking to yourself? <laughs> right? And um, from the most subtle school, the middle way consequence school, the Prasangika view, is that um, they are kind of like two selves. There's the pretender that never existed ever at all. And then there's the self that does exist merely labeled on the collection. And a sense of any more self than that is too much, but a sense of no self at all is going too far. And so that's interesting. So the self that exists is the self that is merely labeled on the collection of parts, the relative self. Um, the ultimate self completely empty of inherent existence. None of that is how we live in the world. The way we live in the world is a belief in an inherent self. So, you know, the surface, surface, surface level is you believe you are your gender, you are your nationality, you are your socioeconomic status, you are all of these things, right? And, or you are your sense of humor, or you are your intelligence or whatever, right? When all of those things are causes you created, but conditioned by things other than you. So take, for example, your body. Um, you created the cause for this type of body, but this particular body came from the substances of your parents, right? Like you didn't like mold it out of clay and say, now I'm going to put my consciousness in here. You know, like you had parents and then you ate things and the things that you ate had an influence and your mom ate things. And, you know, like <laughs> you can't take total ownership over your own body, even though your consciousness lives in it and has to experience life through it. It's sort of not yours in and of itself. Right. Mm. And then you think of your mind and you think, OK, well, I have ownership of the thoughts in my mind. Surely, surely those I made myself. But are the thoughts you're having in your mind right now unrelated to the conditions around you? You know, if a cat just jumped on the curtains and ripped them while I was talking, you'd be thinking a little bit of that. 
And if I was saying something different, you would be thinking about different things. And whatever your life experience was coming to this topic influences how you hear what I say and also the broadband speed <laughs> and also how much you ate right before and this and this and this and this. So do you have 100% ownership over your own thoughts? You know, they're all influenced, aren't they? Yeah, probably. You know? <laughs> So if you, if you don't have so so what we're trying to do is to un oh sorry go on yeah go on <laughs> well I was just thinking if if you have um, if you're not um, responsible for well you are responsible for your thoughts but are they your thoughts to begin with is I guess the question how about they're yours but you didn't make them all by yourself okay <laughs> I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> And they're your responsibility, but they're not your fault. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Okay. I get it now. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So how does this work in daily life? You try and think of something, for example, like, um, have you ever had, I don't know, some beef with someone, you know, there's just someone in your life who you're just having issues with and you're not getting along and they're driving you crazy and you're just like, Ugh. and you're walking down the street and you see someone across the street and you think it's them, that person, your nemesis. And when you see them, you just start thinking of all the things that are driving you crazy. And you're like, oh God, I hope they don't see me. Should I go back? Should I change directions? What should I do? Ugh. And then the person turns a little bit and you realize it's not even them. It's just somebody who looks like them. You are as upset as you would be if it was actually them. And, you know, we've all had some sort of experience like that. And yet we still believe that person we don't like gave us the yucky feeling we're having. Yeah, we still are giving them all the credit for our mood. Even though we could have that mood, even if it wasn't even them. Who made us upset? We made ourselves upset. You know, just like the snake in the rope or the snake in the hose, right? So when we're looking in daily life, what we're trying to remember is... Sure, they were a condition, but they were not the cause. Yeah, things happen to people all the time and you, there's a million different responses. And all of those responses make sense given those individuals' contexts. And then your response then feels self-evident as if it's the only response a person could ever have. And what's more, you feel very identified with it and defensive about it. Right. And so what we're trying to do with these kind of analysis is to unlock the mind's potential to see infinite possibility, but not to let go of ethics. You know, so that's the that's the razor's edge that we're living on when we're discussing emptiness of inherent existence is that everything is empty of inherent existence, including good and bad. And that does not negate morality, ethics that positive actions lead to happiness, negative actions lead to suffering. And that seems like a paradox, but it's not. It's the razor's edge we need to walk on when traveling the spiritual path. Does that make sense? Ish? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So just, you get the basics fairly quickly, and then you just kind of go over it and apply it to the different situations in your life where you're hooked and you believe the drama. You know, and then try and think of times when you could engage with the drama and operate within a drama and not be dis disassociated from a drama. Um, it was all happening, but you didn't buy into it. So other emptiness thoughts before we do six perfections and then uh, and six perfections are very straightforward and then we'll call it a day. But yes, that book um, is fantastic if you want to learn more emptiness by Geshe Teshi Saring, Foundation of Buddhist Thought Series.